All right. Well, welcome at this uh, first webinar of 2019. Uh, first Exeter webinar of 2019. Uh, and we're going to talk about maybe a resolution for you for the new year, and that will be using Excellentia. Why would you want to do that? Um, well, let's let's talk about the SIL verification module within Excellentia and how you can efficiently uh, model SIFs while benefiting from the Excellentia data core. As you are probably familiar with our webinars, um, you know that the audio is provided via the GoToWebinar application. Uh, so you need to enable your speakers. Um, the application has automatically muted your microphone. Uh, so that means that I can talk, but you cannot. Um, therefore, there is a questions tool on the right-hand side in your, in your uh, GoToWebinar panel. If you have any questions, please uh, you know, ask them in that, in that area and um, type them in, and I will read them out and, and, and answer them to the best of my ability. Well, to get started, I would like to wish you and yours a healthy, happy, and functionally safe 2019 on behalf of everybody within Exeter worldwide. Uh, we're very excited uh, to start the new year, as I guess everybody is probably going to be. Uh, and uh, I think we, we're going to have a, another successful uh, year from a functional safety perspective. My name is Iwan van Burden, and I am the uh, CTO and Director of Product Development here at Exida. And as such, I'm responsible for the Excellentia software. Uh, there's a variety of things I do. I'm a member of the IEC 61511 committee on behalf of the uh, of the US. I'm a member of the 84 committee and so on. And there's a variety of functional safety tasks I do on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, I guess my, my, my main responsibility is, is the, the Excellentia software. A little bit of background on Exida for, for those of you who may not have seen this. Uh, Exida is founded on three pillars. And uh, these pillars are a, a certification and assessment pillar. We're a group of, of, of my colleagues that will uh, evaluate products, will certify products or individuals. And you may come across a pressure transmitter or a valve or logic solver that was certified by Exida to uh, IEC 61508 or uh, you know, when, we, when we talk about cybersecurity area to uh, the uh, IEC 62443 standard. Uh, we have a lifecycle services group. Uh, that's basically our consultants that do everything from PHA all the way to decommissioning, proof test specification, and so on and so on. Um, so that's, that's the second pillar. And then the third pillar is the, the enterprise tools, and that's where the Excellentia software falls in, and that's where, uh, you know, where we're going to be, be focusing on today. We have a global customer focus, a variety of offices around the world, variety of projects around the world, uh, you know, going from a large LNG installation in Australia to offshore here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, uh, most of it, uh, most of the the work that I am involved with is is in in the process industry, uh, but uh, you know, some of my colleagues uh, work uh, on a daily basis in the automotive industry where we're deploying similar techniques and measures to protect against unsafe conditions uh, in, in in automobiles. Uh, think of autonomous driving. You want to make sure that when you see a truck on the road, there the, that the car is also capable of detecting that truck. Um, so that's uh, that's an example of things that we're working on uh, around the world. But to get started, we're going to talk about uh, Excellentia, and we're going to talk about the data core and the data stack, and what does that do for you. And, and uh, I'm going to you know give you an overall concept, and I'm going to show you how uh, the data core is deployed in in, uh, in in the SIL verification arena, and then finally we'll have a, a short demo of the of the software as well. So let's talk about the data core and the data stack. So when when you look at Excellentia, you know, one of the reasons uh, that you could you know a, you know ask yourself why should I use Excellentia? Well, there's, there's a variety of reasons, but the, you know one of the arguments is hey we have best in class tools, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know the tools by themselves are very interesting, but it really comes to life when you start to use the tool together. So we have a very good integration of the various lifecycle tools. And then uh, finally, we have uh, the ability to exchange information on an enterprise level. So let's look at that. 
Um, so first, you know, best in class tools. So when you look at the functional safety lifecycle, there's a variety of tasks that you need to perform. You need to do a PHA, you need to do a LOPA, you need to do silver selection, you need to do an SRS, you need to do SIL verification and so on. And for each of these tasks, we have a, a particular tool. Uh, all the way to our SILSTAT offering where, um, you know, it's also part of the excellent umbrella, but still that offering that that will um, uh, will help you record operational event data. So uh, you know, failure rates in the field or record proof testing or record maintenance activities, items that happen in, in the field. And, and each of those tools you know, com is compliant with current standards, uses industry best practices, and provides you know, the documentation that, that is required to support you know, your, your work process. So the tools by themselves are interesting, but you know, when you really want to use Excellentia, when you really want to see the benefit of, of Excellentia, you need to think of data. And if we look at the safety life cycle, we see a top-down approach starting with, let's say, a concept of a plant all the way to decommissioning. But if you think about data, data that is created or generated throughout the various tasks in the life cycle, uh, we collect data as part of the PHA. We collect data as part of the LOPA. We collect data as part of SIL selection and so on. But the LOPA data is going to be based on the PHA data. The SIL selection data is going to be based on the LOPA results. The SRS is going to be based on and so on. So data really flows throughout the life cycle. And when we get to the operational event recording, your hazard event, your hazardous event sequences and, and you know, operational experiences, they are input into your PHA. So when we talk about a safety life cycle from a data perspective, it is a true cycle. And that's what we're representing here with this diagram. You know, the, the gray arrows are the data elements that, that transfer from one phase to the next, to the next, to the next. In the center of this diagram, you see the circle consisting of three parts, and we refer to that as the data core. And what does the data core do? It has the ability for you to uh, document your institutionalized knowledge, project configuration aspects. It has the ability to um, collect uh, information as you record it as part of your lifecycle task. So if in the PHA I record a safeguard, and then later on, that safeguard becomes an independent protection layer. And then later on, it may become a safety instrument function. As that data element goes through the different phases of the life cycle, it is going to be part of this library of information that is just being added, you know, information is just being added to that data element. And then the third part is, is our databases and the, you know, the thing of the uh, Exeter uh, Safety Equipment Reliability Handbook database. We're going to show this, in, or I'm, I'm going to show in more detail how this works on the uh, on the SIL verification end of things, how those libraries come into play, how the project configuration or institutionalized knowledge portion, and how the um, how the databases come into play. That's our data core. Now, if we take that and and look at it, how can we deploy the software within an organization? We come to this data stack. And the data stack um, basically shows the different levels that you can deploy the, the Excellentia software on. So we start at the bottom with a tool layer. Uh, this is where you have the individual tools utilized for a specific task, and there's basically no interaction between them. You can use the software like that. The project layer, that's basically a reference to the previous slide. That's where we use all the different modules in the software, and we, we exchange those modules um, uh, we change the data between those modules uh, seamlessly uh, from you know, one phase to the next. Then the third layer is a database layer. This references our ability to uh, populate a master alarm database or control the master alarm database for a variety of control systems, uh, in, a, in a particular interface with our alarm rationalization software, SIL alarm. On top of that, we have a configuration layer. The configuration layer allows us to automatically generate the logic for a safety PLC based on your specifications in the silver tool, based on your specifications in the design SRS, we will automatically generate the logic for that safety PLC. It's a significant time saver, but it's a different webinar. 
And then the, the fifth layer is the access layer. That is where we interface with enterprise systems like a CMS or an ERP system where we can you know, exchange data from the Excellentia core to uh, uh, to that enterprise system. And it's also if we start to record operational events, uh, failures, maintenance activities, et cetera, that's where we interface between our SILSTAT module and, 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 and an ERP type system. So those are the different levels that we can deploy Excellentia on. And that last image we refer to as our data stack, in the middle is that data core. So how does that data core impact our SIL verification? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, we have a library. Uh, one of the three parts in that middle is, re referenced, is referred to as the library. And this allows us to collect all the information that you're specifying as part of your different lifecycle tasks and transfer that information from one tool to the next. So if you in the SRS have a specific requirement for, let's say, a mission time, we can transfer that over to the SIL verification tool. Or once we get to the SIL verification tool, once we've modeled everything, we can transfer that information over to, for example, the, the SILSTAT module where we collect operational event data. The libraries also record all the groups and lags and devices that we specify as part of our SIL verification. And they will allow uh, for uh, us to easily reuse those parts in subsequent safety functions. You'll see that in the library, we collect all the information associated with a logic solver and as such can allocate IO channels to, uh, to specific uh, IO modules. Uh, and I'll show that in, in the demo in, in a little bit. And then finally, um, in the library, we keep a collection of all the device models and all the devices that you have specified in your project. And the difference between a device model and a device is that a device model refers to a specific make a model of a product. Um, and then each device is, is, is basically an entity of that. So I can have a uh, pressure transmitter X, uh, manufacturer Y, and I have 10 of those in my plant. Uh, the, the, the tool keeps track of all that. So what does this look like? Okay, data transfer between tools. Uh, on the screenshot here on the, on the right-hand side, you basically see information that is collected during the analysis phase. And on the right-hand side, the information that is specified during the design and implementation phase. And we can see all that information in, 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 a, in a blink of an eye. For example, we can see that the intended mission time is 15 years, but the s design mission time in this case is also 15 years. So if it, if it would differ, you would, you would see that here. So we can easily compare that. Uh, that information. The reuse of sensors and fine elements. So group can be reused, as I mentioned, and within the library, we can see all the groups, we can see where they are used, where they're deployed, and we can see how we can, um, you know, how we can, uh, you know, if we make a change in a particular group, how it's deployed to all the safety functions that, it's, uh, that it is part of. And that is also a benefit. So if you have a a final element group or sensor group that is the same between different safety functions, you, there's a one place where you can make the change to it if you need to make any changes and it's automatically deployed to all your safety and semantic functions. It's a huge time saver. We talk about the intelligent logic solver, the ability to uh, allocate IO channels to uh, IO modules. Uh, so the tool keeps track of the physical IO channel allocation and thereby uh, basically knows what your cabinet wiring should look like. Uh, so for example, if you have redundant tr uh, transmitters, you may decide that each input goes to a separate uh, input module. Uh, if you specify that, the tool will take that into consideration. And again, logic solvers can be reused throughout uh, the various safety and semantic functions or you know, the entire safety and semantic system. The device models, as I, as I mentioned already, um, uh, are a, a, a representation of a particular make and model of, of a transmitter. And once you've specified that within your project, it's going to be made available for all future selections from an easy drop-down list. So instead of you having to search through a list of, of equipment items in the database, you can just simply pick and choose real from your, let's say, project preferred uh, vendors. Um, now, 
you may have one device model, you may have 50 separate devices, and we keep devices eventually can get serial numbers when we when we are uh, deploying the software in uh, in the um, operational and maintenance phases of the life cycle where we keep track of uh, of each individual device uh, but by by combining it all or linking it all to a particular device model we are able to easily determine failure rates operational event failure rates and and look at the overall device performance So um, that, that's, the, that's the library aspect. In addition to that, we have project configuration, uh, a part of our knowledge capture. Uh, and I'll show you, we can specify silver project parameters, which are going to be our default parameters that we use for all our safety and semana functions. And uh, we have predefined reports. And I'll, uh, if I remember, I'll show you one of the reports at the end of the demo. Um, Specific to the parameters, there's a variety of items that um, we have set defaults for, uh, and they may be your project defaults, they may not be your project defaults. In, in this project configuration, you can update that. I'll show that to you in the demo in just a bit. Um, and um, any new safety function that's created after you've updated your project parameters will have those default parameters uh, set uh, in, in, its, uh, in, its, in its system. And then we have the predefined reports. We have a summary and a detailed report. For those of you familiar with Excellence Year 3, in Excellence Year 3, we had an IEC 61511 compliance uh, report that basically combined SIL selection, SRS, and SIL verification. Uh, in Excellence Year 4, at this point, we've chosen to have detailed reports for each phase of the life cycle. So we have a detailed silver report, we have a detailed select report. We don't have that combined report, but obviously you can you know, generate both reports and put them together and you have the combined report. The databases is the third part of the uh, of the data core, and this is where we reference our uh, safety equipment reliability handbook, our embedded failure rate database, as well as your device model database. And I'll show that uh, on the next slide or so. So the safety equipment reliability handbook database, I assume most of you are familiar with. Uh, we have over 1,500 unique equipment items in our uh, in our database, and um, there's a viewer uh, basically for all items. Uh, and and in, in the screenshot here, you can see a data sheet for uh, a generic pressure transmitter. And uh, obviously that data will be automatically used in the tool if you select that item. So you don't have to type in your own data. You can, however, type in your own data. Uh, so if you have any, any uh, specific uh, failure rates that you want to use, Make sure that they all fall within the SIL safe data limits. Uh, you know, don't use unrealistic data, uh, but you can type in your own failure rate information. And um, you, know, you do that once for a user-defined item, and then you can reuse that user-defined item over and over and over again. So that is another time saver, um, where in the older versions of Excellentia, every time you had a my own or a user-defined element, you have to specify that uh, over and over and over again. Here, it's part of that device model library. You specify it once, and you can use it in all your safety and cement functions. More importantly, if you realize that, you know what, the failure rates that I used uh, were a little bit too optimistic, I need to adjust that, or you know, maybe the failure rates were too pessimistic, I need to adjust it. You can go into the device model library, change it there, and automatically it's applied to all the safety and cement functions. So that's a very powerful and time-saving uh, feature of the software there. So those are the three core aspects, uh, the libraries, the project configuration, and the databases. So let's see this in action. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll try to reference each and every part as I'm, as I'm using it, uh, but we'll, I'm going to do a very simple demo. Uh, cons you know, we're considering a, a, a furnace with a uh, main fuel going in, uh, three pressure transmitters on that main fuel line, uh, a shutoff valve, main fuel shutoff valve, as well as uh, four individual burner valves. And then we have instrument air and we have a, a pressure transmitter on that uh, instrument air line as well. And two hazard scenarios were identified, a high main fuel pressure 
uh, scenario and a low instrument air pressure scenario. Uh, those two we want to uh, model and evaluate. Um, the high main fuel pressure scenario uh, is using the three transmitters. They're going to be voted two out of three. Uh, the low instrument air pressure is going to use a single uh, input um, that we see there. And then uh, in both cases, we want to close the main fuel valve or all four burner valves. So we have two sets of valves that we want to uh, drive to the safe state. So let me go to uh, the Excellentia software. And I have a, a, a demo file here. Um, I, that's pretty blank. Um, I, the only thing I, I did here is I prepared the two safety functions from a uh, housekeeping perspective. I gave them a name and number. Uh, so the high main fuel pressure is one with SIF001, and uh, the other one is the low instrument air pressure, SIF002. That's the only thing that I prepared. Um, let me go back to the dashboard. On the dashboard, we have that project configuration, and part of that project configuration are here the silver project parameters. So these are what I mentioned earlier. So this is where you can configure what your default parameter should be for a variety of items. So some things for the fine elements, some things for the logic solver, some things for uh, the sensors. Uh, so let's say I want the mission time for all my safety functions to be 20 years. I can specify my, my function like that and um, uh, or I can specify the parameter like well, we can see um, any new function would now have that 20 year parameter. However, if I go back to the silver tool, you will see that the mission time for this, uh, let's start with the high main fuel pressure scenario, is still at 15 years. Well, that was the number I already set. So if I change my defaults, it's not going to impact any existing safety function. It is going to only impact any new safety function that I will specify. So it doesn't impact any existing uh, you know, information that you have specified. So that's a project configuration aspect of the tool. Um, also on the dashboard, we have the safety equipment reliability handbook database. So uh, here's an overview of all the uh, all the data items in the tool, and I'm just uh, uh, randomly uh, uh, picking something, and we have a data sheet for that particular item. And I can filter, so if I don't want to show anything manufacturer specific, I could say, you know, uh, show me anything that has the word generic in it. Uh, if I do that, I can see all the generic items that are currently in our equipment database. All right, so let's go to the silver tool and let's start modeling. Um, so at the top here, you'll see a variety of, of you know, let's say, housekeeping, name, tags, descriptions. Uh, we can select who's doing the, the work. In this case, it's myself. Um, I, I've only created uh, one. Uh, uh, one team member in this example project, but I can put in any comments that I want. I can link to particular references. So if I have design references that I want to consider, I can select those. Now, where do these come from? Let's go and view our library. In the library, you will see references. And this is where I have a list of all the references in my project. Now, these are default ones that, that, uh, that we put in in our default project. Uh, but what you will see here on the right-hand side is you can either link or attach uh, a reference as well. So we can actually embed a, a document in, uh, in, in the file to, to allow you to uh, you know, basically transfer with, 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 with the file. We can specify a unit. In this case, I, haven't added, I didn't specify any units yet. That's why you know, this is empty. That's all housekeeping. Uh, then below here, we have actual... Uh, parameters that will impact our, our SIL verification. Uh, first, we have architecture constraints. Do we want to use IEC 61511 or IEC 61508 architecture constraints? Both are valid selections per the IEC 61511 or ISA 61511 standard, uh, but um, you, know, you, can, you, know, you can pick and choose. Uh, consider SIL capability or, you know, is the product are the products that you're selecting, are they uh, assessed and evaluated per IEC 61508, or are they proven in use with documented uh, history? Um, and we can say yes or no to, do I want to consider this in my SIL verification? I'm going to uncheck this for now, 
uh, if you do a, a full SIL verification, this is something that you have to do. But I'm going to select a lot of generic equipment and, and very little of the generic equipment is actually certified. So um, I'm, I'm going to you know, get a SIL zero on, on, on the systematic capability uh, unless I do proven and use justifications and, and you know, we don't have the time for that. I can specify the mission time. So let's, uh, let's make that 20 years. Um, and I can specify the startup time or restart time. Uh, which is the amount of time it takes to get everything back up and running after a spurious failure. And then the demand mode, uh, a couple options here, low, high, continuous, or based on the demand rate. So if you use our LOPA tool and you put the laser protection in the appropriate sequence, we can calculate what the demand frequency is or expected demand frequency on your safety and some other function. And then based on that, we can automatically determine the demand mode. And then we have, uh, you know, how do you want to handle your I.O. channels? Do you want to, if you have a redundant configuration, do you want to send them to separate uh, I.O. modules or do you want to all go to the same uh, same I.O. module? Then the site safety index, uh, you're probably well familiar with that if you've attended some of our webinars. And you can specify that here for sensors, logic, solar, and fine elements, respectively. And with that, you basically set the overall SIF level parameters. So then let's go to the sensor part. In the sensor part, what we want to do is we want to add a sensor group. Uh, that sensor group, um, that sensor group is going to represent our uh, two out of three uh, transmitter voting. So this is the high main fuel line pressure. And it's a two out of three voting. So I'm going to select two out of three. The tool says, hey, you know, if you have a two out of three voting, you need three individual lags. Do you want to automatically adjust for that? And the answer is yes. What that does is it now in that group, high main fuel line uh, pressure, it now specified three individual lags. I have the option to click on is diverse, in which case I can indicate that uh, uh, the equipment in each lag is different. Or if I leave that unchecked, I basically indicate that the equipment in each lag is the same. In the latter case, I only need to specify the equipment once. Uh, the tool is smart enough to know then, hey, uh, this is what is used in all uh, subsequent uh, installations. So let's jump to uh, the sensor lag. Just for housekeeping again, I'm going to call this PT101. Uh, the first transmitter, uh, and it's a pressure measurement. And because I select pressure, we will have certain items available from our dropdown list. So I'll select new process connection. And you see specific remote seals that we have there for, for various manufacturers. Uh, but in here is also an impulse line, a generic, let's say, impulse line where we have a couple of different options. I'm going to choose the no plugging option. The no plugging option represents uh, not necessarily that we have clean service, which is what we named it in the past, but that there is maybe pre predict, uh, preventative maintenance to avoid any plugging. So, you know, in operation, you do not experience plugging or maybe you have heat tracing or, or something like that. So that's the process connection that I'm choosing. And then for the sensor, I'm going to select a generic and I can I can scroll through the entire list of items or I can just say I'm going to filter and I only want to see those things uh, that have the word generic in them. And I'm going to select a generic transmitter. Now notice that um, the PT-101 is only applied to the first lag, but the equipment that I've selected is applied to all three. Uh, so if I want to go in and say, you know what, this is uh, uh, PT-102 and this is uh, PT-103. I can do that, again, from, from a housekeeping perspective. But everything that I selected here for PT-101 is automatically set up for the other uh, lags. It's a high trip. Uh, I'm going to trip if the pressure is high. Uh, I'm going to drive internal detected transmitter failures under range. So that um, if there is a if there is an issue, I can uh, uh, I, I can you know, uh, 
go to to a, a, let's say a safe state um, I'm going to say that I can detect out of range signals meaning that anything outside of the 4 to 20 milliamp function um, can um, uh, you know can, can be detected as, as a transmitter fault or unhealthy uh, process value and then uh, you know do I have a trip delay you know can I filter out any transmitter faults or um, uh, do I trip on a transmitter fault? In which case, say sure. Uh, if I have a two to three voting, if one of the three is bad, I'm going to consider that a vote for trip, and I'm going to degrade to one of the two. Um, I see question here, and I'll answer that in, in a little bit, just to let you know I've seen it, but I'll answer it in a little bit. Um, I can specify uh, the proof test interval. So let's say I'm going to do a five-year proof test interval. And I can click on this proof test coverage calculator and it will automatically calculate the proof test coverage for this particular sensor arrangement. And with that, I've specified my, my sensor part. I now go to define elements. And the define element interface is kind of similar as the sensors. Uh, in this case, I have a main fuel valve or four burner valves that I need to uh, close. And I model that to two separate groups. And I just simply click that add group button twice. The voting between the groups is one of the two. If my main fuel valve is successful, I will be able to stop flow or all four burner valves. If they are successful, I will be able to stop flow. So the voting between the two is, is, is one of the two. And you can see here that uh, now I've, I've uh, specified these two groups, and you can see them here in the tree as well. You could, by you know, leaving the selection here on fine element part, just you know, enter information for both groups at the same time. That may be a little confusing, so uh, I'm choosing to look at the main fuel valve first, and then um, and then at the burner valves. Uh, the voting for the main fuel valve because I have only one uh, uh, is going to be a one out of one voting. Uh, I, uh, I click on that triangle to define a lag. You now see that that lag shows up. Um, I can I can give that lag a name XV101. Um, I can then select equipment from from my drop down list. So let's say. I want, again, generic equipment. Uh, we're not favoring any particular manufacturer here uh, in the webinar. Uh, so I'm selecting a generic three-way solenoid. And then for my final element, I'm going to choose a generic air operator ball valve with a soft seat. Very easy to select those equipment items from my uh, uh, database. I can click on the proof test coverage calculator and the tool will suggest a 69% proof test coverage for a full stroke of this particular valve. And again, I can specify my proof test interval for now. Let's just change this to two years um, just to play with it a little bit. And uh, so with that, I've specified my main fuel valve. Now, couple of things happened. I selected equipment. And because I selected that equipment, that particular make and model, in this case, a generic three-way solenoid, is added to my device library, a device model library. And if we now go to the burner valves and we select a four out of four voting, because all four burner valves need to go to the safe state in order to achieve the safe state, um, a total of four lags is going to be uh, defined. Let me... Uh, Quickly give these a name. Um, so it matches up with our drawing. All right, uh, and I'm going to assume that they are identical, meaning that every single lag has the same equipment. But um, one of the things I may choose in this case is to say, you know what, I'm using that same type of solenoid. I'm using that same valve that uh, 
uh, that I specify for my main fuel valve? Why would I use different types of valve for this particular service? So I can go in and I could, you know, I could go in and find the generic three-way solenoid again. Of course, I scroll past it now. Or because it's now part of my device model library, and let me show that to you real quick, view library, and I go to my device models, you see that three-way solenoid and the air operator ball valve part of my device model. We'll come back to that. I can simply click on this link icon and I see all the final element interfaces that I've specified in this project. So that's my project preferred vendor list, so to say. But it makes it very easy you know, to select the equipment for this particular Fine element. Of course, you know they need to be exactly the same as same make and model as as I have for my main fuel valve. But you know, typically on a project, you'll have a lot of common equipment. Let's say proof test coverage here uh, automatically calculate uh, 69%. That is just the full stroke of the valve. Uh, notice a couple of other options: open on trip. Uh, tight shutoff, severe service. I'm assuming that I do not need tight shutoff to achieve the safe state. I'm assuming that the valves operate within their you know, normal operating profile and not severe service. And the valves obviously are closing on trip and not opening. Uh, so that's why all these remain unchecked. I'm going to leave this proof as an to one year. So you can see we can have different proof as an for different parts of the safety and cement function. And every single one of these lags now has uh, that equipment assigned to it. Last but not least, the logic solver. And in the logic solver, I just go to our equipment database. And in this case, I'm going to select the generic SIL3 certified PLC. Um, I'm going to click on the proof test coverage calculator for it. And I'm going to say, hey, I want to test this once every 10 years. Again, another uh, a, a, a different proof doesn't evolve. As I make these changes, you see the, the tool calculating and uh, making sure that, that, that my, my data is, 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 is correct. Um, but then if I look at the logic solver specifically, what I see is that the tool has allocated my inputs, PT101, PT102, PT103, to three separate analog input modules. And the reason it did that is because I specified that I want I.O. channels on separate I.O. modules in case of redundant configuration. For the finer elements, well, I have a total of five outputs, the main fuel valve for XV101, and then the four burner valves. They each go to a separate output module. So the tool does all that allocation. If I go to my library, you will see in the library now that I have a sensor group, which is the high main fuel pressure. I have a sensor lax, PT101, 102, and 103. Final element groups, there's a couple of acts right here that uh, that I'm actually not not using, but uh, when I was playing around with this test project earlier, they, they uh, I created them. I should have deleted them. But anyway, at the bottom, we see the main fuel valve and we see the burner valve as they are uh, specified with the various lags five flags. Look at the device models. These are all the makes and models of the devices that I've used. But if I look at the individual devices, we see that there's a total of three input, uh, yeah, three inputs, so impulse line and, and, and transmitters, that there's a total of five solenoids and five actuator valves, uh, because that's all the equipment that I'm using. So in here, you know, I could, if I, if I, you know, look at that particular device, I could even document its serial number. Now, usually during SIL verification, we don't know that information, but later on in the operational event recording phase, we do know that information and it's it's becoming part of this entity, part of this data element. All right, so that is the first safety function. And as you've seen, we've been able to use some items from the library to speed up our, our modeling. Uh, so now let's go over to the second safety function. The second safety function, low instrument error. Um, same selections here. Let me change this to 20 years. Um, same selections here as on the previous safety function. I unchecked that systematic capability. 
for now because I'm using generic equipment. The sensor part is going to have one group and that one group has a single transmitter, one out of one sensor. And this is the uh, instrument air pressure. And um, that is uh, PT201. There we go, PT201. It is a pressure measurement. And again, because I've already specified a pressure measurement before, I will see all the items that I specified before. In this case, it's that same impulse line that I'm using. And on the, on the sensor, it's the same sensor that I'm using. So it's very easy to specify my equipment. I specify my uh, proof test coverage here, and I'm done modeling the safety function. Maybe I want to proof test this transmitter once every four years. I'm, I'm, I'm purposely using different intervals to show you that not all the intervals need to be the same. Quite often they are all the same, but um, just from a from a operational perspective, that may be easier. Same outer range detection. If I detect an unhealthy process value, I'm not going to vote for trip. I'm going to leave that up. This is a low trip. And I'm going to drive any internal detected failures over range, so away from the trip point. So all this can be specified here. Now let's go to the final element. My final element is going to look exactly the same as for SIF1. It is going to have uh, it's going to have those two final element groups. Well, how do I do that? Do I have to model it again? No. We can reuse them or link them, choose them from our library. So here's that link icon here on the right-hand side. If I click on that, uh, at the bottom, I see my main fuel valve. I can just simply double click, and here's my main fuel valve group. Let's say I want to add another group, and that group is the, is the burner valves. I just go to that drop-down list, double click, and here are the burner valves. And with that, I've specified all the items that are part of... Uh, of my fine element. The one thing I need to make sure I do is that I need to adjust the voting here. It's a one out of two voting. By default, we always go to the conservative option. We always go to you know, X out of X, uh, conservative for, uh, for safety. In this case, it's a one out of two, so I need to adjust that. The logic solver then, now, it cannot be any easier. You just select it from the drop-down list and you're done. So let's uh, then hit our recalculate um, and calculate the uh, safety and semantic function. And what we will see at that point, there we go. Uh, what we will see then is that if we look at that logic solver, we see it's the same six, seven, eight, nine, ten modules for my outputs with the same logical channel or the, you know, the, the, the I.O. go to the same channel number. But for my input, because it's a new input, this one is now going to the first analog input module. And to be precise, channel two on that first analog input module. So the tool now knows that channel one, and we can see that here, on that first analog input module was PT101, and channel two is PT201. So, uh, so that's something that uh, that the tool can easily keep track of. We use a variety of different proof test intervals. Uh, if we if we go to the PFD charts here at the top, we can kind of see those in our PFD chart. Um, for and this is for SIF number two, where we have a proof test interval every five year, uh, sorry, every four years for the uh, for the transmitter or the sensor. We can kind of see that here. We see there's some proof tests going on elsewhere as well. So let's see every five, oh, every 10 years, my bad, every 10 years for the logic solver and every two, one year and every two years. So there's some, let's say, weirdness going on. It's not really weird. We said we're going to do the burner valves once every year. We're going to do the main fuel valve once every two years. That's what we specified. So uh, you now that's what you also can recognize then here in this, in this pie chart, or not in the pie chart, in this PFD chart. And of course, the cumulative of those is, is my actual probability of failure on demand. And we can see that we achieve a risk reduction of 24 in this case, uh, which equates to a SIL1 for PFD average. And we achieve SIL2 
for um, uh, for our architecture constraints. So that's why you see that uh, appear here as well. Uh, for our first safety function, well, let me close this uh, this uh, real quick. Uh, on our first safety function, you see we don't meet our risk reduction factor of 100, uh, primarily caused by the final elements. And we can see that here in the risk reduction calculator. We can also see that here in the pie chart. So if we want to make any changes, we need to do it here. Uh, so one thing that we could change, for example, is we could change the proof test interval uh, on the main fuel valve to once a year. Um, let me just recalculate, see what that uh, what that does for us. Uh, Come on. Not a whole lot. We went for risk reduction 42 to 46. Um, but one thing to point out is that uh, in uh, proof test interval for the second safety function has also changed to one year. So because it's the same entity, we change it at one place, it's automatically changed in, in both locations. In our library, we can see uh, that we have just those two fine element groups. The other ones we, are, we already ignored earlier. The sensor groups, we see the two, the instrument air, the fuel pressure. On the device models, the same number of device models after the first safety function. And the reason is we didn't use any new uh, make and model equipment. Uh, if we look at the overall devices, however, we see that there is now uh, a new or a fourth transmitter and a Ford impulse line. Everything else is the same. So we know exactly what is used and, and where it's used uh, within uh, within the system. So that is a quick show of uh, of the Accenture software. Oh, the reports uh, before I forget, so we can generate a report. Uh, so let's just generate the silver summary just as an example. Uh, let's do it for everything in this project. Um, so the report is being created, and I should have set open on uh, on completion because I forgot where I <laughs> I forgot where I saved it. Oh, it was just on my desktop. Well, okay, let's just recreate it again, and it's open on completion. It will then automatically launch Word, uh, which it does on my second monitor. Well, let me turn these things off. But we can we can see the project. Uh, we see the version of the software that it was created with. Uh, we see the, the uh, layout of the safety function, um, the overall results, and we have those pie charts to show uh, what, we've, what we achieved. Uh, so that's a, a quick summary. And then we have a, a more detailed uh, report. Uh, let me generate that as well. Uh, uh, And okay, now it's opening up on the on the correct screen. Um, and we see the overall target and achieved uh, sill levels. We see the PFD chart. We see a short, small image of of that uh, of the safety function. And then we have the individual failure rates that are being used uh, for the sensors and the logic solver as well as the fine elements. So all that information is then. Uh, yeah, available in, in all the detailed information is available in, in that report. Um, something else that is uh, probably worth showing, uh, if uh, if you have this option, uh, we have a uh, ability to generate a uh, cause and effect matrix uh, based on uh, the configuration that uh, that I created. Um, I didn't specify specific tags. I gave names to the lags, but those are not the tags. So the tags will be part of a tag library that I can can link to. Uh, but what you see here is your you know your three initial inputs operating uh, in two out of three. Then the 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 fourth one is is the one out of one, and you can see that everything operates the same uh, the same uh, final element. So. Uh, again, if I would have filled in the tag library and be able to use that, uh, it would it would show all that information here in the cause and effect matrix. So that is in a nutshell, I guess what what I wanted to show you in uh, in the software here. Um, so that brings us to 
questions, and, uh, and uh, I have a couple here. Um, so how are functions that don't shut down the entire plant managed? Consider the setting for startup time at the project level. So you know, after a shutdown, after not necessarily a complete shutdown, but after a safety function uh, goes to a safe state, um, there, there is, you know, there is some repair needed, or and and startup or restart of that one safety function, uh, even if it's just a reset, and all that is 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 taken into consideration in, uh, in that parameter. So, it's not necessarily the, you know, the startup of the entire plan. It could be just a restart of that one safety function uh, that you would uh, would look at. Uh, and here's a here's a philosophy uh, you know, uh, question. So in in, in some uh, tools, uh, you will see that proof test intervals are calculated. So you give the tool a target, and it will then determine what is your uh, proof test interval. Uh, within Excellentia, we've chosen the approach that you, as the user, specify the proof test interval. Um, if you want to do any optimization, you know you would have to go a little bit back and forth and and, and pick uh, an appropriate test interval. But it's our philosophy that it's better to match um, uh, the proof test intervals to what operational what is what what is operationally realistic, than say, hey, I need to do a proof test every 3.67 months. Um, uh, nobody's going to you know uh, stick stick with that. That doesn't typically fit in a normal. Uh, yeah, operating uh, profile schedule. So we don't calculate proof test intervals. It's something we could do, but we've uh, purposely chosen not to do that. We consider an input parameter and, and do it based on operational uh, experience. Are reports available in other languages than English? Um, there are some reports that are available in, in different languages. Um, uh, other reports are, are in, in the process of being translated uh, and that that sometimes takes a little bit longer than than you than you than you wish it would take, uh, but we're we're obviously all the reports are in English. Uh, we're working on a Spanish, German, and Portuguese uh, as uh, as uh, as other reports, uh, other languages as 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 basis. Um, something to do that I that I, that I, that is I think worth showing is that in the tools menu, and this is something that's new in, in Excellentia 4 as well, we can choose languages. So uh, you see a couple of languages, and, and you know, this is a work in progress. This is not something that is uh, that is completely done. Uh, but I can go in and change my interface to, um, uh, to Chinese, and you'll see that some portions of the tool have been changed or have you know, Chinese characters as as part of their uh, of their description. Uh, fortunately, the word language we did not translate, so it's easy to to go to go back, uh, at least for myself. So uh, that is something that uh, that you'll see as, as as different labels get get translated. You'll see you know, appear more and more. Can I show how to create a my own device? Yes, I can. Uh, I'll I'll do it quickly. Um, um, so I'm not going to spend too much time, effort on uh, on a particular uh, you know, definition of a safety function. I'm just going to create a new SIF. Um, I'm not even going to give it a name. Just notice that the mission time is 20 years because that's what I set as the, the default. Uh, and then just go to, uh, let's say, the sensor part. I'm going to add a sensor group. Um, Let's say this is a, a level measurement. Doesn't really matter. Uh, I can make selections from from the equipment database. I can, if I would have specified anything on the level end, I could select it from here. In this case, not. Or this UD user defined, I can specify my own level measurement. So level uh, measure device. So. Um, I can then, you know, document all this information. Um, I don't think we need any of this right now, uh, other than failure rates. So I'm going to say um, uh, uh, this is my dangerous undetected failure rate, and 
I'm just going to assume a safe and detective failure rate. I'm not going into the low and high, again, just to keep it simple. This device uh, will have uh, a process as an input and it will drive an analog output signal that goes then to an analog input on the on the logic solver. And I think this is everything I need to, oh, I can specify the proof test coverage as well. So let's just assume it's a 90% for now. And I can hit create and I've defined this user defined device. If I now go to the library, uh, where are we, the device models, you can see now that there's a level measure device here. And if I say view, I can see that same interface and I can make changes to this at this point. Or uh, let's say I have a second sensor group uh, and that sensor group is also a level measurement. Typically I would recommend modeling this in, in one group, but you know, this is just a demo how, how that user defined device is now available from that link uh, menu. So that's, you know, you specify it once, uh, it's updated here. Uh, you, know, you can select it here. If I go back to the library and I say uh, the device model, say view, and instead of level measure device, I'm going to call it level measuring device. You see that that is automatically already updated here. Both cases where it said level measure device, it's already saying level measuring device. So there's a central place where I can make changes to those user defined devices. Uh, uh, here's a question on PHA data. So if, um, uh, let me go back to that uh, uh, data flow diagram. Oh. Um, uh, the question here is, can data be imported from other tools? Um, and, and the answer is yes. And obviously, uh, I would like you to use Excellentia for everything. I would like you to use the PHA tool for everything. That way, uh, our facts tool, that way the data is all set up. But you may have used a third-party PHA tool and you may want to import that. Uh, yes, data can be imported. We uh, have an application desk that is, is, is you know, is, is, is a group of people that, that uh, will help with this kind of uh, imports. Um, if I go to my libraries, um, so reference, for example, you'll see here there is an export or import of references. So I, if I have something in an Excel spreadsheet, I can easily import that here into my, my library. With a PHA, however, uh, it's typically a little bit more complex in that uh, you know, there is a there is a relationship between causes, consequences, safeguards. It's not a flat file, so uh, that's why we typically suggest using the application desk. Uh, they will be able to uh, to quickly import uh, that information for you um, and make sure that everything is imported correctly. Some tools also have the ability to uh, uh, change allow you to change the name of a column. Uh, from let's say cause to initiating event, and you know, not all imports expect initiating event when in, in the PHA uh, discussion. So yes, information can be imported. Uh, I would recommend using our our help desk for that. Um, and then uh, two questions that uh, that relate to the automotive industry and and the ISO 26262 standard. So uh, the question here is: Can Excellent should be used for non-process applications such as autonomous vehicles? Um, and actually, I was talking to a customer earlier today, and and, and this was with regard to machinery industry. And, and you could argue machinery industry, or discrete manufacturing, and and process industry relate a, a little bit more than autonomous driving. Um, but the answer is yes. Um, Excellentia or silver specifically, uh, because we, the, the webinar was focusing on silver, uh, silver specifically uh, is, is just a modeling tool. Uh, you, you can, you know, whatever arrangement you have, you can, you can model in the software and you can define what your sensors are, you can define what your fine elements are. And in the automotive industry, they will be a little bit different than uh, in this example for, for, uh, for the process industry where, where we have valves. Uh, they also may be valves, but there may be some other uh, acting elements. Um, so yeah, silver can be used, Excellentia can be used for your PHA or LOPA if you deploy those techniques in, in, in the automotive. Um, the, main, the main 
uh, thing to look at at that point is that the equipment data that we have in our equipment database is really representative, or at least the majority, is really representative of the process industry. Uh, so if you use it for anything other than that, um, it, it, it may be beneficial to um, to work with our uh, consultants to come up with a, uh, yeah, let's say, a database of of, uh, of of devices that are that are typical for uh, ISO uh, 26262 applications. Uh, so um, I know that some of our guys have used the so uh, the, the tool uh, in in automotive applications. Um, I, I cannot say that we have any concrete plans at this point. That you know, there's a little bit of you know, demand, and and uh, you know, we'll have to see what the requests are from. Uh, from the overall industry, but uh, this is a very interesting, uh, interesting question. All right, um, I think with that uh, we've reached the end of the questions. Um, if you want to know more, uh, we have a an open enrollment training scheduled in Houston, uh, which is the second week of February, February 12th and 13th. Uh, it's in the Marriott North there. Uh, very nice location. Uh, so if you if you're interested, to feel free to uh, to join us there. Uh, also, if you want to play with the software, you can go to excellentia.com and sign up for a free trial. Uh, follow us on the social media: Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, for latest uh, news. Any conferences that we're attending. In case you want to see a live demo or want to see something specifically, uh, you can also contact me. My contact information is here on on the slide, as well as uh, I can get you in contact with one of my contacts to set up uh, one of my colleagues to set up a a, a demo. Um, there's a variety of courses that are coming up. Uh, some uh, here are online. Uh, basically, they're half days, uh, full day split over two to half days online courses we have a layer of protection analysis with excellentia training class coming up at the end of this month and then this SIL verification course that i just mentioned uh, in in houston uh, these are north america based uh training classes but we have training classes all over the world so i would say go to exeter.com training to see everything and we also have online self-based training um and SIL verification with Excellence is one of them. If you're interested in that, uh, you know, go to again our training website slash online uh, to uh, to to look at that. So with that, I hope uh, that uh, I've answered your questions. I hope that I've uh, intrigued. Uh, for those of you who are not using Excellence, to start using Excellence, make it a New Year's resolution. Uh, thank you for uh, dialing into this first uh, webinar of the year, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk and on the next webinar or maybe one of the trade shows uh, or if you have any questions feel free to reach out uh, the recording of this will be made available as well as the uh, the slides so uh, uh, thank you for attending and um, you know if you have any questions please reach, reach out and we'll talk uh, we'll talk to you soon take care bye bye